أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 81 سورة الأنعام We'll begin from ayah number 70 وذن الذين اتخذوا دينهم لعبا ولهوا And leave those people who have taken their religion as amusement and play Diversion وغرتهم الحياة الدنيا And whom the worldly life has deluded Leave the company of these people. Don't stay in the company of these people. Why? Because then you will become the same. You will also lose respect for your religion. All that you will be concerned about is play, amusement, and the fun of this world. Their attitude, their behavior is also going to influence you. Whether. Wa is and, and this ayah is directly connected with the previous ayat. In the previous ayat we learned about those people who mock at the ayat, that when they're mocking at the ayat, when they're doing khawd in the ayat of Allah, then what should a person do? He should not stay there anymore. Similarly, a person should also leave the company of those people who have taken their religion as la'ib and lahu. Now, who are these people? And what does it mean by their religion? Deenahum, Their religion refers to, if we take the meaning of الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ If it refers to the non-Muslims, then they have taken their religion, meaning the religion that they follow. So for example, the Mushrikeen, their religion was of shirk. The Yahud, their religion was of Yahudiyya. And the Christians, their religion was of Christianity. So those people who have taken their religion as larib and lahu, meaning their religion revolves around amusement and fun and play. There is nothing serious in their religion. There is nothing serious. Secondly, it is said that الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ They have taken their religion. And their religion refers to Islam over here. Meaning the religion that they are obligated to follow. This is the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for all people to follow, for all people to observe. Instead of following this religion, what are they doing? They are taking it as La'ib and lahu. Now what's the meaning of la'ib and what's the meaning of lahu? La'ib as you know is used for play, game, basically physical activity that a person is engaged in for the purpose of entertainment and joy. La'ib is physical activity, physical engagement in something. And lahu is fun, play, diversion and basically it is the when a person is emotionally involved in something for the purpose of fun and enjoyment and pleasure. So, la'ib is done through a person's limbs and lahu is done through what? Through the heart. So, they have taken their religion as la'ib and lahu. Meaning, how do they do that? Either by making fun of their religion, by mocking at their religion. That each time the topic of religion comes, they start mocking at it. Instead of talking seriously about their religion in order to learn about something, what do they do? They begin mocking at it. Similarly, it also means that they have a very non-serious attitude towards the religion. They don't take their religion seriously. All that is left of religion is entertainment and fun. All that is left of religion is entertainment and fun. So for example, even within many Muslims, throughout the year, They're not concerned. But when the time of Eid comes, then what happens? They get their new clothes stitched. They have a party. They will go out. They will have fun. But throughout the year, nothing on the name of religion. Nothing whatsoever. So when the thought of religion comes to their mind, all that they can think about is la'ib and lahu. Not seriousness, not worship, not sadaqah, not ibadah. They're thinking about fun. Similarly, today if a person, if they wish to go to the masjid, they will only go if there is some fun over there, if there is a basketball night or if there is some event, then they will go. To the conference if people will go, they will not go sit in the lecture, where will they roam around? In the bazaar. So this is what la'ib and lahu is. All that is left of religion is just fun and play. So fun and play under the banner of religion. Such people, Allah says, leave them. Don't stay in their company. Why? Because you're going to develop the same attitude towards religion. 
وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Moreover, these people, the life of this world has deceived them. غَرَّتْهُمْ from the root letters غَيْن رَا رَا The worldly life has deluded them. How? That they think that everything will be fine. Dunya is so much fun. Death is far. Life is long. They take the deen very lightly. They don't give importance to their religion. وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا The fun and pleasure and entertainment of this life has deluded them so much that even in religion what they're looking for is fun. وَذَكِّرْ بِهِ Leave them, but still remind them. ذَكِّرْ Remind. Through what? بِهِ Through the Qur'an. Why? أَن تُبْسَلَ نَفْسٌ Lest a soul is arrested. بِمَا كَسَبَتْ Because of what it has acquired. تُبْسَلَ is from the root letters بَا سِينْ لَمْ بَا سِينْ لَمْ And بَسَلَ is to arrest someone by force. What does it mean? To arrest someone by force. It is to jail, to lock up, to arrest. It is also said that basala is to offer a living being, meaning a human being, as a rahan. Remember what a rahan is? What is it? A security deposit. When you're taking a loan and you give something as a security deposit that you keep this belonging of mine and when I will return your loan to you, you give this back to me. So basala is also to offer a living person, a human being, as a rahan. So for example, a person says, you keep my son until I return this loan to you. This happens even today. This happens even today. I met this family once and they had given their son to the leader of their particular village and their son was literally like a slave to them because they had taken a loan. And once they would return the loan, then their son would come back to them. And their son was in his 20s now. And he had been given when he was a little child. All his life he had been working as a slave. So this is what basala is. To offer a human being, a living person, as what? As a rahan. So basically, when a person is arrested, he is offered up for destruction. He is jailed. He is locked up. He does not have any freedom. He does not have any freedom whatsoever. Similarly, when people, when they hijack, for instance, a plane or some vehicle or something, or, or some place, even some building, what do they do? They keep the people inside as hostage. That when you will give us this money or when you will agree to sign this contract, only then we will let the people go. If you don't, these people are not going to be allowed to go. This is what basala is. To keep people as hostage. So, antubasala nafsun. Remind them, remind these people through the Qur'an, lest a person is arrested. Arrested where? Offered up for destruction where? In the akhirah. Because when a person is arrested in the hellfire, then that's it. There is no coming out. There is no getting out. And tubasala nafsun bima kasabat because of what it has earned. Because of the sins it has acquired. Just remember, every person who does not please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who ends up upsetting him in the year after, where will he be? He will be jailed. He will be jailed. So how can we want that we don't want to be jailed in the year after for ourselves, but other people, they're doing something wrong before our own eyes, our own family members, our own friends, and we don't remind them. We don't remind them. We don't even tell them. We don't even teach them. We don't even share what we have learned with them. Don't we realize that if they don't change their ways, they're being offered up for eternal arrest in the hereafter? ذَكِّرْ بِهِ أَن تُبْسَلَ نَفْسٌ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ Because of what it has acquired. And once it is locked up, once it is arrested, لَيْسَ لَهَا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيٌّ He will have no wali besides Allah. وَلَا شَفِيعٌ Nor any intercessor. Who is wali? One who removes the difficulty. And who is shafir? One who removes the difficulty how? By his request. Wali is one who removes the difficulty by his own power, by his own ability. And shafir is someone who will come and request and thus the difficulty will be removed. You understand? Wali can take the steps himself. But Shafir, he can request. 
that steps be taken. But a person who is arrested in the hereafter, no wali, no shafir, nothing. No one will come and help him. No one can even try to help him. It is also said that wali, one who is a permanent supporter, and shafir is one who supports you temporarily. وَإِن تَعْدِلْ And if it compensates. تَعْدِلْ From the root letters, عَيْن دَالَّانْ What does عَدُلْ mean? Justice. And it also means to be equal. Remember? يَعْدِلُونَ They equate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ So وَإِن تَعْدِلْ Over here, meaning it offers an عَدُلْ It offers an equal amount why? In order to free itself. In ta'adil, if it compensates. Who? Kulla adilin. What? Every kind of compensation. If a person wishes to free himself by offering every kind of compensation, whether it is the entire world and everything within, or it is a person, or it is his entire wealth, or it is the entire earth of gold, any kind of compensation if a person offers to free himself from this basala, from this arrest, la yu'khad minha, it will not be accepted from it. Ula'ika, those people, who? Those people who take their religion as la'ib and lahu, who have been deluded by this worldly life, they are alladina ubusilu bima kasabu. They have been arrested, why? Because of what they have acquired. This is not injustice on them. They have brought this upon themselves. Like a person who was arrested, who was put in jail. Why? Because of the crime that he has done. Similarly, ubusilu bima kasabu. And once they are arrested, lahum sharabu min hamimin. For them, there is a drink of boiling hot water, wa adabun alimun, and a painful punishment bima kanu yakfurun, because they used to disbelieve, because they used to deny. What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, we learn from this ayah about the prohibition of taking the religion as la'ib and lahu. La'ib and lahu. That we should have a serious attitude towards the religion. Unfortunately, many of us, we don't even think about our religion, seriously taking our religion, learning the deen, practicing the deen, following the deen. And if we do even come to learn the deen, then what happens? Still, our behavior, our attitude is not serious. If we're studying anywhere else, if we're working anywhere else, we're more than serious. But when it comes to the religion, it's just la ibn lahu. All we want is fun and entertainment and play. And if we're reminded that we have to become serious, we say, why do we have to make deen so boring? It doesn't mean deen has to be boring. Seriousness does not mean boredom. Does not mean boredom. Seriousness means doing what you're supposed to do. So first of all, we learn about the prohibition of taking the deen as la ibn lahu. Secondly, we also learn from this ayah about the obligation of leaving those people who have a non-serious attitude towards their religion. Who are careless and heedless about their religion. They want fun and amusement in the deen as well. And all that they're concerned about is having fun all the time. Why is it that watching a movie for three hours is not difficult, but going to a lecture for an hour, an hour and a half, is so burdensome on many of us? Why? Because all that we're concerned about is la'ib and lahu all the time. So sitting seriously for an hour, for two hours, is something very burdensome, for most people today. We also learn from this ayah about the obligation of leaving those people who are fully engrossed in the life of this world, who have been deluded by this worldly life, thinking that this life is permanent, that have fun, be merry, enjoy, and don't worry about anything else. Leaving the company of these people, those people whose goal is the dunya, those people whose goal is just to be successful in this world, just to increase in this world, not the Akhirah. Because what will happen? If a person does not leave the company of these people, what's going to happen? First of all, he's going to become sad and depressed 
and he's going to feel that he doesn't have enough compared to what they have. For instance, you're learning the deen. Now, you've been here for half a year. By the time you finish this course, it'll be a year and a half. Those of you who just graduated from university, maybe your friends are working. And they tell you, oh, we've made this much money. And you're like, I lost this much money. Because I had to pay the fees every month. And look at my friends, they've made so much money. Similarly, it's possible that some of your friends they may have completed another degree, another certification. And you're here learning the deen. Now, if you keep comparing yourself to them, what's going to happen? First of all, you're going to feel bad. You're going to feel left out. Secondly, this is ingratitude for the favor that Allah has given you. Allah gave you the deen, knowledge of the deen, knowledge of His book, understanding of His book. But He didn't give it to them. And you're feeling pity for yourself? You're feeling bad for yourself? So it leads to ingratitude. It leads to feelings of unthankfulness. So don't be so impressed by them. Don't stay in their company all the time. And if you stay in their company all the time, then you will develop the same thinking. You will develop the same thinking. That I should also be making more money. I should also be going to this school and that school to get this degree and to get this name and that certification. And at the end of the day, what am I going to do with it? Nothing really, but I can say at least I went to that school and got this degree. So the obligation of leaving those people who are fully engrossed in this dunya, deceived by this dunya, deluded by this dunya, that their ultimate goal, their ultimate goal is the success of this life. They're not concerned about the akhirah. Not at all. Similarly, for instance, a person, he wants to make sure that he's living in a house that is bought from halal money. He cannot afford it. So he's living in a small house. Maybe it's a rental unit. And there are other people who have taken a huge, nice, fancy house on mortgage, on riba. And you keep comparing yourself to them. Now, their goal is to be successful in this dunya. And your goal is to be successful in the akhirah. If you stay in their company all the time, it's going to make you unthankful for what Allah has given you. It's going to change your behavior. You might think to yourself, maybe I should do the same. Everybody is doing it. Maybe I should do the same as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, leave the company of these people. We also learn from this ayah that a person should not stay in the company of such people, however he cannot boycott them. Why? Because Allah says, Wadab, leave them, however, Wadakir, also remind. Now, how can you remind someone if you've boycotted them completely? So, leaving them does not mean saying bye to them forever. Leaving them means what? Not being in their company all the time or most of the time. Not hanging out with them all of the time. Because if you do, you will be influenced by them. And if you are in their company, then what should you do? That could be he. Remind them. Don't say, oh yes, what you're doing is right. And mashallah, you've earned so much money. Mashallah, this house looks so beautiful. Although I know it's on haram. I mean, in your heart you're going to say that, but on the apparent you might be saying, mashallah, it's so beautiful, it's so nice, everything is so perfect. I think you got a very good deal. No. You're not going to say such things. If you are going to speak to them, if you are going to be in their company, remind them, make them realize that what they have done is wrong. Because if you don't, you're letting them being offered up for a rest. A rest. Just imagine when the angels of death come. One are those angels who come with bright faces, taking the soul, you know, with ease, reminding him of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are the other angels who come and literally arrest the person. You know, one is to receive and the other is to arrest. One is to receive and the other is to arrest. The good angels who come, they receive the person, taking him to pleasure. Just as, you know, a child that is born, he is received immediately. He is taken immediately. And on the other hand, there are angels who come and arrest. So whatever you want for yourself want for them as well. So if you know somebody is doing something wrong because of being deceived by this dunya, don't tell them what you're doing is good. Remind them. Make them realize. We also learn from this ayah 
that a person will be arrested or will be offered up for destruction in the year after because of what it has earned. Allah is not unjust. Allah is not at all unjust. And therefore, we should all look at our actions. That am I doing anything wrong that could make me worthy of being arrested there? We also learn from this ayah that when a person is caught by Allah, then he will never be released. He will have no supporter and he will have no friend whatsoever. And no compensation even will be taken. By who? A person who is caught by Allah. We learn in Surah Ghafir, ayah number 18, مَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ حَمِيمٍ وَلَا شَفِيعٍ يُطَعَ For the wrongdoers, there will be no devoted friend and no intercessor who is obeyed. No one who can come and help them. قُلْ say, Meaning, O Prophet وسلم, say to them, Another room in Dunillahi, shall we invoke besides Allah? Malayan Faruna Walayaduruna That which neither benefits us nor harms us. We learned that the Mushrikeen, they said to some Muslims that follow us and abandon the religion of Muhammad. They said to them that follow us, come back to our ways, look we're so happy and you're suffering so much. Leave him. Come back to us. So over here, the Prophet ﷺ is being commanded to say, and after him, all of the Muslims are also being commanded to say, if they are invited to such a thing as well. Like for example, a person becomes a Muslim, he converts to Islam, and later on his family is like, you're going through so much hardship, come back to us. Come back. We'll accept you. Similarly, the Muslims at the time of the Prophet ﷺ were also told, follow us and abandon the religion of Muhammad. So say to them, Another room in Dunillahi, shall we call upon besides Allah, ma la yanfa'una wa la yadurruna? Something or a being whom if we worship, it cannot benefit us. And if we don't worship, it cannot harm us. Who brings benefit and harm to us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And other beings whom you worship besides Allah, they don't benefit, they don't bring any harm. And if we do revert to disbelief, if we do prostrate to your idols, then what's going to happen? وَنُرَدُّ And we will be returned عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِنَا On our heels بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ After Allah guided us. Meaning, if we were to leave Tawheed and go towards Shirk, if we were to leave the commands of Allah and go toward your whims, then we would be turning back after Allah gave Hidayah to us. After Allah gave guidance to us. Over here, نُرَدُّ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِنَا Literally means to turn back on heels. But this is an expression for meaning. What? It gives the meaning of reverting. Meaning going back. Leaving that which a person is on and going the completely opposite way. So after Allah guided us, if we left the deen of Allah, we would be going towards ضلال, misguidance. And this is the way of who? This is the way of Kalladi, like the one who istahwathu shayateen, whom the shayateen, whom the devils, whom the jinn, they have led him astray. Meaning, if we were to abandon the deen of Allah, then we would be like the person whom the shayateen have led astray, fil ardi in the earth. And that person, he becomes hayran, he is confused. Lahu ashabun yadrunahu ila alhuda. And his companions, they're calling him to guidance, saying, Tina, come to us. Then we would be like such a person who has been possessed by the shayateen, who has been misled by the jinn. He's not using his mind. He is confused. He's perplexed. He's wandering here and there. And his friends, they're calling him, come this way. Where are you going? Then this would be our state if we were to leave the religion of Allah. Now what's this? Comparison that has been made. The one who, Alladhi istahwathu. The word istahwathu is from the root letters ha wawiya. And what does hawa mean? Desire. It means to become fond of. And literally it means to fall from a height. One najmi ida hawa. What does hawa mean? To fall from a height. Now, generally when someone falls from above or when something falls from above, 
You don't know as to where exactly it's going to fall. Especially if it's from, from what? From a very high point. For example, you drop a piece of paper, you drop even like a ball or anything from a height. You know the general area. But you know where exactly it's going to hit. So from this, istahwa is to make someone lose their way. When a person has been misguided, when a person has been tempted away, when a person's aql has been taken away from him. So this is an expression for someone who has been made to lose his way. A person who has been made to lose his way. A person who has been misled. And the description that has been given over here, الَّذِي اسْتَهْوَتْهُ shayateen. This is the description of a majnoon person. Of a person who is mad. Meaning a person who is insane. The Arabs, they thought that a person, if he was mentally or psychologically disabled, it had to do something with the jinn. This is what the Arabs used to think. And many times, even today, there are cases in which if a person is psychologically disabled, then it has something to do with the jinn. Many times. Not always, not every case, but sometimes. Because shayateen, what do they do? They put whispers in the heart of a person. Which is why we're told to say that, Rabbi a'udhu bika min hamazati shayateen. From the whisperings of shayateen, save me. Because this negative thinking, or thinking negatively about yourself or about other people, or about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where does this come from? Shaitan is one who puts it in a person's heart. So the Arabs, they used to think that if a person suffered from mental or psychological disabilities, that always had to do with jinn. That's what they thought. It's not always the case, but that's what they thought. Which is why they would say to the Prophet sallallahu as well, that he has been possessed by the jinn. So, الَّذِي اسْتَهْوَتُ shayateen is the example of a person who is mad, a person who is insane. And this person, if he's walking, if he's going anywhere, will he be walking properly or will he be going towards his destination? No. Generally, people who are mentally disabled, who have psychological issues, what happens? There is always somebody or the other with them. Isn't it? You don't let them go by themselves. Sometimes people will literally lock them up in the house. If they are to be taken out, they will be made to sit in the back of the car. Right at the end. Why? Because if they're sitting in the middle or the front, it's possible they will open the door and run away. It happens. So, this is the example of a person who does shik. That he has lost his mind completely. Similarly, a person who is drunk. Is he walking properly? Is he driving properly? Is he speaking properly? No. الَّذِي اسْتَهْوَتْهُ shayatin. Somebody who has been enticed who has been possessed by the shayateen, who has been led astray by the shayateen, fil ardi in the earth, and as a result he is hayran. Hayran is from the root letters hayara. And hayran is when a person is confused, he is baffled, he is bewildered. So this person becomes hayran, confused, not knowing where to go. He's lost. Like for example, sometimes people who are mentally disabled, if they're found somewhere alone, if you ask them, where do you have to go? Or what's your name? Or where do you live? They don't know. And sometimes if you ask them too many questions, they might get upset. They might begin to cry. They might begin to yell. They might become very defensive. So, hayran, they're confused. Lahu ashabun, and he has companions. Yadurunahu, who are calling him. Meaning his friends, his family, they're calling him, ila al-huda, to the guidance, that i'tina, come to us. They're telling him, come to us. But what happens? He does not respond to them. And as a result, he ends up destroying himself. He ends up harming himself. Like for example, it's possible there's a person who is mentally disabled and he doesn't realize about what he's doing. He goes at the top of the building and his family finds out that he's at the top of the building. They call him, come to us, come to us. But he jumps off. He jumps off because he's hayran. Istahwat wa shayatin. He's thinking he's only going to jump off, let's say, a step or something, or he's going to jump into a pool because maybe he's hallucinating or something like that. But in reality, he's going to jump off a building. And he doesn't realize. 
This is the example of a person who leaves Tawheed and goes to shirk. Who leaves the religion of Allah and returns to disbelief. Because no matter what you tell them, no matter how you explain to them, no matter who tells them what, they don't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand. They don't even listen to those people who are most sincere to them. They don't listen. Allah says, قُلْ say, إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ Indeed, the guidance of Allah, هُوَ الْهُدَى It is the only guidance. Meaning the guidance that is given by Allah through the messenger is the right guidance. And whatever that goes against it is all misguidance. وَأُمِرْنَا And we have been commanded لِنُسْلِمَ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That we submit to the Lord of the worlds. What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, we learn about the prohibition of leaving, of compromising. What? The deen. And especially tawheed. Especially tawheed. Worshipping and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Because many times there are people who, when they're overcome by their grief, when they're overcome by their problems, then in those situations they turn to other than Allah. For instance, if there is a couple who hasn't had children, what will they do sometimes? They will go to a saint who has been dead for hundreds and thousands of years perhaps, and they will go pray over there, they will offer a sacrifice over there. And this is what? Shirk. But what do we learn from this ayah? That it is not allowed, completely prohibited, to compromise on Tawheed. To compromise on their religion. Secondly, we also learn from this ayah that calling upon other than Allah after knowledge of Tawheed is madness. It is insanity. Because if a person, if he believes that Allah is one, if he believes that Allah is the Raziq, and he's asking others for risk, what does it mean? He's not using his mind. He is doing what a mad person would do. He is doing what an insane person would do. A person who does not have a sound mind. He's not using his mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him. We also learn from this ayah that real guidance is that which is taught by Allah. وَأَنْ أَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ And that establish the salah. This is connected with وَأُمِرْنَا لِنُسْلِمَ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Meaning we have also been commanded that we should establish the salah وَاتَّقُوهُ And that we should fear him. وَهُوَ الَّذِي And he is the one who إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ To him you will be gathered. And if you submit to Allah today, then that day you will not be forced to submit. But if a person does not submit to Allah today, then on that day إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ To him you will be gathered. And then you will have no choice but to submit to his command, to submit to his decree, his will. وَهُوَ الَّذِي And he is the one who خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ he is the one who created the heavens and the earth in truth. وَيَوْمَ يَقُولُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ And the day he says be, and it is. Meaning he is the one who created the heavens and the earth with a purpose. بالحق. What does بالحق mean? With a purpose. For a just reason. For a just cause. And he created them with حق. Meaning he created them correctly, properly. بالحق. وَيَوْمَ and on day meaning وَذْكُرْ يَوْمَ and mention the day recall the day which day is this? the day of judgment يَقُولُ he will say كُنْ be فَيَكُونُ so it will become meaning the day that he will say be to what? everything that is dead meaning come alive or he will say that قُومُ rise up or the hour to establish the day of judgment to begin so what's going to happen? The day of judgment is going to begin immediately. فَيَكُونُ قَوْلُهُ الحق. His word is the truth. Meaning, when he will command that the day of judgment be established, it will definitely be established. Because his statement is حق, it will definitely take effect. It will definitely occur. It is free of any doubt. وَلَهُ الْمُلْكُ And to him belongs the dominion. When? يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ On the day that the trumpet will be blown. The dominion will belong exclusively to him. Absolute, 
power and authority will belong to who alone on that day? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and none but Him. When? On the day that the trumpet will be blown, meaning the day of judgment. Yunfakhu is from the root letters noon fakha, nafakha. And asur is from the root letters sad wa ra. And what is asur? A horn, a trumpet, in which one blows in order to create a loud sound. And asur is the horn in which the angel Israfil will blow when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command him. And he is going to blow multiple times. The first time that he will blow, what's going to happen? Everyone and everything in the heavens and the earth will become unconscious. And then what's going to happen? He's going to blow another time. And what's going to happen? Everything will come alive. يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ the day that the trumpet will be blown. On that day, only he will have authority. None but him will have authority on that day. Who is Allah? Alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He is the knower of the unseen as well as the witness. What is shahada? That which can be observed. That which can be seen. And ghayb is maghaba. That which is absent. That which cannot be seen. So he knows about what is in the unseen. And what is visible? He knows about what is absent and what is present now. Whether that absent is something in the past or something in the future. And shahada is that which is present now. He knows about everything. The ghayb and the shahada. The unseen and the visible. As well as what is absent and what is present now. وَهُوَ الْحَكِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ And he is the wise and he is also the one who is most aware. What does it mean by this? That he is the Hakim and Khabir. Why is this mentioned over here? That he is Hakim, there is hikmah behind every command of his, every decision of his, even behind the bringing of the Day of Judgment. There is a great wisdom behind that. And what is that wisdom? That each person be recompensed for what it has done. And he is Khabir. He is fully aware of what? Of everything and everyone. So when he will give the recompense, his recompense will be most fair, most just. Because he is Khabir. And Khabir is not just one who knows the outward, the apparent, but he is one who is aware of the hidden as well. The secret as well. The batin as well. That which is hidden. That which a person does not show. Therefore, his recompense, his judgment, is that which is most just. We learned that, as I mentioned to you, that the trumpet will be blown. And between the two blowing of the trumpet, there will be a time, meaning a pause, whose length Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of. That once the angel will blow the trumpet, everyone will become unconscious. So after how long will the angel blow the trumpet again for everybody to come alive? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware. And only He will be living because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hayy. Everything else will be gone. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ To whom belongs all sovereignty today? Because all the kings, all the managers, all the leaders, all the owners of this world, they will be finished. They will be gone. So Allah will ask, in Surah Ghafir, Ayah 16, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ That to whom belongs all sovereignty this day. No one will respond to Allah and he will reply himself, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ And he will say that to Allah, the one, the prevailing. It belongs exclusively to him. We'll listen to the recitation of these ayat. In any way, you can't. The only way of helping is what? By getting rid of the jinn. But until that person is following the jinn, until that person is overcome by the jinn, you cannot help him in any way. Because no matter what you say to them, if he is possessed by the jinn, if he is being led by the jinn, he will not change, he will not move, he will not accept any advice, any guidance from you. And this is the example of a mushrik. Because Sometimes you see that you try to advise them, you try to tell them, you try to make them understand. 
but they will use logic when it comes to math, when it comes to science, but when it comes to religion, they will not use any logic. And you don't understand why it is that they don't get it. Such is the case of the mushrik as well, in some instances. Especially someone who was on Tawheed and went to shirk. Who was on the religion of Allah and he abandoned it and went towards kufr. That you cannot help that person. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, he doesn't get it. Until eventually, he destroys himself. Just as someone who is mentally disabled, eventually, many times what happens? They are the ones who destroy themselves, harm themselves. It's not other people. They harm themselves. Similarly, this person is offering himself for destruction. You advise them. You tell them. You keep telling them. لَهُ أَصْحَابٌ يَدْعُونَهُ Doesn't get it. Doesn't respond. So I'll go. Um, yeah, just for psychology, in our classes we had to see a few patients and they had anterograde or retrograde amnesia. And in that what happens is that they're basically their mind is stuck on one traumatic event that happened in their life, like maybe a really bad car accident or a death of a loved one. And they're just stuck on that particular thing. So if their family calls them, if the doctors, nurses, anyone calls them, they're just stuck on it. They're not able to get out of that. So similarly with the mushrikin in these ayahs, they're just stuck on shirk and just stuck on those habits. So... Whatever you try to advise them with, they just, they just don't listen, they don't get it. So they just go back to that. Until eventually the person destroys himself, finishes himself. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.